Hello and welcome to Women Tech Makers. This is a series where we bring incredible technical women to screen. And uh, I'm joined by this amazing Robotics Brain Trust today. Uh, Corey Lantham is the CEO and founder of Anthrotronics, and she's going to tell us about that and her, her other work. Um, and Yoki Matsuoka is here, who is the VP of Technology at Nest. And she has incredible, also, robotics background. So welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, I think that the robotics future is so exciting. And you guys came in really early into this world. Um, you threw an incredible athletic twist, which I want you to talk about, and uh, that, that Yogi came in. And Corey, you threw sort of a space, sort of the space entry. So um, maybe talk a little bit about that, and we'll come to what you're doing in a minute. So yeah. say, yeah, how did you get into this world? Yeah, so it's really different from many people how people get into robotics but when i was growing up there were no initiatives with robotics yet mm -hmm. and i was a tennis player a tennis junkie that's all i knew how to do in college when i was getting a lot of injuries i was searching for something else and i picked sort of the most athletically interesting engineering which happened to be robotics mm -hmm. so i stumbled upon a lab that I was building a hopping robot and I thought, ooh, this is kind of like tennis. If I'm going to build a little tennis buddy robot for myself, then mm -hmm. I got to learn how to do this you know, hopping and legged robotic work. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started. One of the things that happens a lot in school is that um, some of the ways we teach science and math kind of turn kids off to it because they're not actually doing it. They're learning the history of it. So they don't really experience how to make stuff. That's so true. Yeah, they so actually... was there something early in your history that kind of taught you, hey, I can do this? Or... You know what? I didn't even connect that math and all those things are connected to what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. I liked math and I was good at it, but that was it. So you came much later to this. It, it just, yeah, my brain was totally somewhere else. And, and you were a nationally ranked tennis player. Yeah, yeah. nationally ranked, yeah, that's awesome. right, yeah. And then sort of the connection happened, like robotics, that's fun, I wanna build things, I, it would be really fun to do. Mm -hmm. And then turns out it's like, oh, math is useful. And you know, <laughs> computer science is useful. Yeah. All those things sort of slowly start to come into places. Totally. Yeah. Corey. Yes. We, we have a funny overlap because my freshman job was with uh, Professor Dave Aiken at MIT and is, uh, you know, building machining stuff as sort of junior person on the space systems lab. And he later went to Maryland right. where you uh, were on the faculty adjunct and you worked with him, I think. So yeah, I know that you did a lot of really interesting work with robotics and people in space putting things together. Talk a little bit about that and also early on. How'd sure, you come in? Sure, sure. Well, my, my uh, interest really came from being a space junkie. Uh -huh. So you were a tennis junkie, <laughs> I was a space junkie. And I was fascinated with science fiction. I read, you know, science fiction voraciously and loved Star Trek. Um, and so I think that combined with I really wanted to know how do humans live and work in space. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut. And, and so that is what inspired me to learn more about what does it take mm -hmm. to have humans live and work in space. Mm -hmm. And that's what propelled me, I think, into a graduate program of aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. And then finding out the technologies that were emerging that could enable this. I mean, certainly we know about robots from science fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, what robots were actually available or mm -hmm. what technologies were actually available. And, and so it was at the time, very exciting time to make it real, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very cool. Um, it's interesting about Star Trek because uh, um, I, I was watching the Makers series, Makers.com, which is all these incredible stories about women, and they had Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a moment that she talked about where Martin Luther King came and uh, was talking to her about why it was so important that she was in the team, just sort of, I'm thinking sort of women and minorities in that team. He actually said that he, it was so important for civil rights for her to be in everyone's living room. And I think the role modeling of, of uh, media and stories come out, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and it actually brings to mind, there was a great Star Trek episode between Spock and Uhura where she's freaking out because they're in some crisis and she's like, she said, I don't know if I can do this. And Spock says, I can think of no better person for the job. Nice. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. You know, and that's actually a theme, like uh, you notice that sometimes women sometimes don't have as much confidence. And so to have a colleague, in this case, like a fictional character colleague, just like reinforce how qualified you are uh, is a really great thing. So nice media moment. So now, um, 
you guys have moved out of those original places and into your current roles, which are just incredibly breakthrough places. So can you guys talk a little bit, talk a little bit about Nest, what you guys are trying to achieve, what your vision is there, um, talk a little bit about Anthrotronics and, and what the vision is there. So maybe. Sure, okay. yeah, sure yeah. I can start. Yeah. So sure. yeah, I think, you know, my passion with Nest is really about human interaction with devices. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we build at Nest is no longer something that people might imagine as robots. It's mounted on the wall. It doesn't have legs, it doesn't move, but it is essentially the same thing. You know, it actually controls house temperature. It monitors through sensors about all the things that's happening in the house. So we still consider it to be a robot. Mm -hmm. And then, so now what can we do? Really the true goal is about letting people be who they want to be because now they're living with some intelligent technology on the on the wall. So not try to have them adapt the technology, but have the technology adapt be to more fluid. Yeah, yeah, to let them be you know be who they want to be. So here's mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. So Nest thermostat. Mm -hmm. Turns out 50% of the energy used in a residential space is by heating and cooling the house. We didn't know that. And so if we could actually even say you know 10 or 20% of that, that's a huge chunk of it. So how can we do it? Mm -hmm. And if we ask people and says, do you like to save energy? Everybody says, sure. of course I do. Yeah. And then, then if you say, well, did you turn off the lights when you left home? They say, yes. Yeah. And then when you say, well, did you turn off the heating when you left home? They're like, uh, I can't remember, yeah. right? And then it was like so much, lighting is 10%, heating is 50%. Why do we know to turn off the light but not heating? So why don't we augment with the technology when we know that they've left the house, why don't we turn it down for them? So those are the places where we're a little bit weak at, but technology is good at. Mm -hmm. Why don't we understand where that right intersection is mm -hmm. and do the right thing for them without removing control from people? Right. Yeah. Yeah, because you let people uh, control from their app, they can control from the device itself. Yeah, it's and then there's a schedule that we learn over time because people are relatively predictable when they leave, and then so the machines that I learn for them, but at the same time, people can always override it. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly important through even experiments. It's really interesting. Where through the field trial, we learn that the moment we interfere a little bit with people's decision mm -hmm. making, um, they get all mad. Right. So that's one of the things that we learn as well through robotics as well. Right. And you know, it, that's, we really respect what they want mm -hmm. and then still try to achieve the same goal with them. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, sort of from science fiction, maybe we think robots are like Terminator, like sort of these extreme things. And perhaps some of them will be hum humanoid in that way. But I think the point that robotic or assistive technology can be exactly in the direction that Nest is going or what, what Roomba was doing with, you know, sort mm -hmm. of cleaning robots Task or even, specific. you know, I work with some of my colleagues at Google X and they have the self-driving car. So, you know, that's really kind of a robot yeah. in a way, you know, yeah. taking a transport robot. Completely. Yeah. yeah. So thinking about robotics in that way. So say... Well, I, uh, well I'd, love, I'd love to build on what Yoki was saying because it really resonates with, with the work that we're doing. I mean, we've been hearing about the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that means to me practically is, you know, the traditional idea of a robot, uh, which is this sort of humanoid type thing or, or this standalone um, uh, piece of machinery has really changed over the past 10 or 15 years as the consumer electronics revolution has, has exploded. So, you know, a robot is simply a sensor, uh, some processing, and an actuator. Mm -hmm. So our smartphones are now robots. Yeah, um, that's right. You know, and yeah. so you know the work that you're doing, um, as you said, it's it's robotic. It's still robotics. Mm -hmm. um, and so so bringing it back to some of the things that that I've been doing in my company, Anthrotronics. So mm -hmm. Anthro Human mm -hmm. um, Tronics Instrumentation, and yeah. we've looked at for the past 10 or 15 years, how do you capture human capability and use that to interface to electronic, um, an electronic platform? Mm -hmm. And in the early days, that electronic platform was a robot. Mm -hmm. So for example, we worked with kids with disabilities trying to capture their, their movements. So a child with cerebral palsy who had very sort of spastic movements, we could capture those and they could operate a robot who could explore their environment, which right. was something they couldn't do. Right. So now we take that, you know, we fast forward and we're doing things like um, taking a smartphone and capturing both passive and active movements to learn about the status of, of, your, of your brain function, mm -hmm. of, your, of your capabilities, and use that information to then um, 
operate on the world. In, in case with kids, it might be a robot, but it could be a computer. In case of the elderly, it might be um, something in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, so the concept of taking active and passive monitoring and capturing that and using that to interface to technology mm -hmm. is still very relevant today as it was you know, 15 years ago. Yeah, very much so. Um, also, I was thinking about education a little bit, you know, just the ability to be watching or sensing what the kids are feeling or mm -hmm. how, you know, how much they're actually learning and leveraging that in that space. Yeah, and, and I think um, there's actually uh, a lot of interest right now in brain-computer interfaces mm -hmm. and the concept of an intelligent tutor um, as, somewhat, as something that actually can sense how well are you learning. Mm -hmm. And the technologies that are being used to sense that are really changing. I mean, we're, we now have EEG that's accessible to consumers that can say, yeah, you really are getting it. And so one of the things that we've been working on um, with the Navy is actually team training. Mm -hmm. How can you measure both physiological and brain response and, and, other, and um, other aspects of the training and the learning to say, is the team really a good team? Is the mm -hmm. team learning well together, not just the individual? That's interesting because uh, Regina Dugan, who mm -hmm. led DARPA, who's, sure. who's now at Google, was at Motorola, um, she was talking about some work in the sports area around, they were calling it hustle on a basketball court. So not just measuring, not just looking as a team at, you know, when you have an, an astonishing player like Michael Jordan or any of these folks performing, but when Michael's doing really well, who else is on the court? Yeah, and so who has amazing hustle to play really well in that context? And the instrumentation of sports in general, um, but the instrumentation on behalf of uh, understanding teamwork and collaboration, both in that arena, um, but in any arena, is pretty interesting. It's interesting. Actually, uh, before Nest, the life that I had was a professor, mm -hmm. you know, also working mm -hmm. in this sort of the neuroscience and robotics area. And one of the things that we realized is that we can measure effort you know, through just contact, robot contacting with humans, and then simply observing movements and then, you know, how active the movements are and then what's normal and what's not normal. Those are the things that really came through. So, we, you know, in context of stroke rehabilitation, uh -huh. sure. we realized that we can even tell when people were paying attention or making really good progress compared to the last week. Mm -hmm. And I think those things are incredibly useful to mix in, and as you say, with the team sports too. Who's currently putting, you know, almost like hustling a lot, and then who are the great players to be combined with? Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole lot of things that we might not be able to bring out simply by just, you know, maybe we can, well, humans are good at getting those things out, but, you know, I think, I don't know, just getting those things out in a robotic form, and especially dealing with people with disabilities, I think that's really fascinating. Right. It's interesting because we all have some part of MIT in common, and there's a, a new plan to start a, a center for uh, advanced like human mechatronics and, and really sort of how do you help people. Specifically, Hugh Hare is mm -hmm. leading that, and he's someone who lost his lower legs in a climbing accident and had made his own amazing robotics legs and encouraged people to watch uh, the TED Talk that he did. But uh, th his, he, on, on the TED stage, he was saying, you know, can we eliminate disability yeah. uh, in general by you know, adapting these technologies. And I think it's interesting the leveraging what you were talking about, the effort, like encouraging mm -hmm. uh, people, knowing what's going on with them and helping to encourage them so they can bring themselves further ahead. It's yeah, pretty interesting. I totally agree. And as, opportunity. and as well as I think there are things, and then we also have sort of neuroscience background, right? But there are things that we kind of don't take advantage of that we know, for example, people, when people have stroke, mm -hmm. there's a lot of time that passes sitting in a hospital, then going home, and then their brain is almost getting worse and worse. Right. And we already know in neuroscience of like, how long should we wait and how long should we, you know, at some point we should aggressively start rehabilitating. So what if technology was available, immerse them in a right way at the right time already in the hospital? So, you know, this big picture of like virtual reality environment mm -hmm. where we put them and then they don't actually even get to experience this getting worse, my movements are not as good, but continue to stimulate the brain so that when they already walk out of the hospital, they're much better off. You know, right? what's mm -hmm. interesting, um, I, I know Mark Kelly, who's an ast amazing astronaut, and uh, Gabby Giffords, his wife, who yeah. amazing congresswoman who was uh, unfortunately shot, 
Mark shared that during the, when she went to the hospital in Houston, the, one of the things they did was exactly what she was saying very early on. Uh, she was, you know, not really quite conscious, but they would lift her up and begin to do things, help her body physically, like her brain begin to work again with her body in an interesting ways. So the speed to helping someone recover um, is turns out to be, as you said, really important. important. So leveraging yeah. robotics for that is interesting. And let me let me just build on that for a moment. The um, I think the idea of eliminating disability mm -hmm. is, I mean, I think that's an amazing moonshot idea that mm -hmm. actually we could go after. And it's not just eliminating disability. How about eliminating aging? <laughs> you know, and I don't sure. mean in this longevity you live forever thing. Yeah. I mean, you eliminate the the disability that seems to define aging. The, mm. the, the, as you get older, you, the, get older the you have the skills. reduction yeah. of skills and the reduction of, of activities. If we could eliminate that, mm -hmm. I would argue you've eliminated aging as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think some of these technologies that we're talking about are, are, are the key to that. I love it. Right. Yeah. So one of the themes here is very much uh, technology in, in service of a purpose, mm -hmm. of impact. And I, I think, uh, you know, I know both of you guys are involved a lot in, in kind of helping younger people see and come into this field. You have an organization that you either founded or are part of. Can you talk a little bit about that? But I think somehow with young people, especially... Um, you know, sometimes, as, as we said, sort of in K-12, we're teaching science and math in this kind of boring way rather than here's the stuff that could really matter for people's lives. And by the way, you happen to use science and math as the language for it and sort of bring it with the purpose. So maybe say a little bit about the organization and what you're thinking. Sure. They're, um, part of two, or, well, founded one organization, and now I'm actually part of another um, the organization that I founded while I was a grad student at MIT is called Keys to Empowering Youth. Mm -hmm. And it was really my aha moment that really until I got to graduate school, I didn't know that women didn't go into science and <laughs> engineering. Yeah, that's interesting. Why you know? was that? What? I think maybe it's this personality of people who go into the, you know, women who sort of in You're the just early, going. You just kind of, I, I, I don't totally know. agree that ignorance cause sort of helps a little bit. You yeah, know, the women like in I physics say this too, because the two areas that continue to be lower, computer science, 15, 20%, and physics, 15, 20%, and, but people just power through. Yeah, and so I think, so, and, well, so until I got to grad school, I, I really just didn't even know that this was an issue. And so it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh -huh. I mean, you're at MIT, which, I mean, the, the undergraduate population, they're doing a much better job at, mm -hmm. at getting... Yeah, they're at almost 50-50, or they're but basically even. I don't know if the graduate population and the faculty has mm -hmm. budged from 20%. Has it's it coming up. Is it coming so, up? So, uh, you know, sort of, you tend to see grad school 30%, and then the faculty okay. more like anywhere from, you know, 10 in certain fields to actually like 30 or 40%. just okay. depends. Yeah, so, Chemical engineering is very balanced, for example, okay. or, or in some of the sciences, like biology, yeah, are sure. very balanced. Yeah. But it's some, a couple of the engineering still, you know, we got to push them. Yeah, Megan, Megan this knows this thing about MIT, actually. I do. I'm on their boards. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, we follow these numbers very closely. Because we're because, working on it. It's yeah, important. I mean, I was there, I got there in 80, 89. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I was one of two women in, in my entering class for graduate school. And, and, and one of only women, often the only woman in a class. And so, so it really hit me like a ton of bricks. And so I, I started doing all the reading and the research and, you know, finding out all the things that everyone already knew <laughs> that, you know, there was, um, that there was this issue. And I really was um, profoundly affected by um, uh, the Sadkers, the, the, um, I think Myrna and David Sadker, I probably shouldn't even say that because I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know their actual names, but I, I read some sociologists' work about the, um, you know, just sort of the, the lack of the brain trust. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. So I think this was my awakening as a woman in in, in science and engineering, mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I was looking at that core at the time. People were talking about, you know, junior high and and um, you know third, fourth, fifth grade. Where the drop offs were going. Where the drop offs were going. Well actually it's more it's yeah, so six I guess sixth, seventh, eighth grade, yeah. junior high. And um, and that spoke to me as well because I found that junior high had been such a disempowering experience for everybody. It's for everybody. Can we just change how we do all that. <laughs> so for for the jan during one IAP, you know, you can propose a, for the January Which is term. The January break. January, yeah. break, January uh -huh. break at MIT, we proposed let's bring these girls, 11 to 13, and bring them on campus and just show them all the cool stuff. And so it went from there. We, we, we started this, um, so Keys to Empowering Youth, Science and Technology Mentoring. The idea is we brought them on, on campus to talk about stereotypes, um, show them some great, um, great uh, uh, 
uh, applications of science and technology and do some problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so that, that now, um, it's still at MIT, it's also at University of Maryland. Um, I'm, not as in, I'm not involved with it at the organizational level anymore, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I'll go and speak. Cool. Um, so anyway, sorry, that was a long answer. But the key but, point is the hands-on. <laughs> the key on. point, I should Hand, probably figure well, out how no, to the, the hands-on experience. Yeah, yeah it was to have the hands-on, the, really the hands-on. Right. I think so, too. I had a, started yeah. an organization as well in a nonprofit in a, almost exactly that format that um, there's a problem, engineering problem. We specifically picked people who could benefit from devices that can enable them in some way. Uh -huh. But then we specifically formed a team made of mostly young girls, mm -hmm. to come up with a solution that they can build on. Yeah. And, you know, that specifically targeted yeah. to about fifth or eighth grader girls. And that was, you know, they just really connected some of the school problems that yeah. they didn't even think was related and said, well, why don't we use physics? Right. You know, we can use this, you know, catapult this thing over to this side of the body. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just a great connection um, to really motivate them to realize, like, wait, the word math and engineering and all those things also can relate to the word like helping people. Right. And then somehow that was just such an aha moment for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a central issue. Um, we did some research in talking to girls and also boys who were opting out of the STEM fields, the STEAM fields. And, uh, and it was over and over again, like not really connecting the impact not really connecting the purpose. And so if we can get past that, and you guys are such an incredible example of just like the kind of impact and, and change you can see in the world um, by working on these technologies. Yeah, um, bringing those examples early on, right? Yeah, yeah um, and, and actually just wanted to add one more thing. They, one of the other times that I think it, it becomes very discouraging for women in engineering is in college and towards the end of college. You mm -hmm. find that I think a lot of college grads um, then move on to something else. They have this great technical background, but they go into law or medicine. Mm -hmm. They don't see that the engineering can do, mm -hmm. can, can actually help the world right. and solve real problems. Do you think they're doing yeah. that because they don't feel welcome or they want to go this other, they don't see the purpose, you think, or both, think some they, combination? I think probably a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and one of the other organizations, I'm on the board of Engineering World Health, mm -hmm. uh, which takes um, undergrad biomedical engineers and gives them experience abroad in developing countries for 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And right. so it gives them this really empowering, hands-on experience mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, over the summer during their college time. And I think it helps them to really see the application of what they're doing. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I think their perception, right, if you go to school of nursing and ask women and says, why are you doing this? And they said, because we want to help people. Right. And so, well, you know, you could also help in engineering. It says, ah, oh, I don't qualify. I'm not good at it. Right. But then what makes you say that? And then when you drill down, they just misunderstood what it means to be good enough to do the engineering. Right. Yeah. And also, um, unfortunately, sometimes the amazing historic leaders, women and minority leaders, aren't as well known uh, as, you know, so we know Turing. Uh, really well, but we don't know Grace Hopper as well. We're starting to because of the Grace Hopper conference, or you know, we know Babbage, the first mechanical computer. We don't know Ada, the first person to suggest programming, and so we, you know, need to work on sort of the historic truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As well. And also, I think role model. I think women, because of a little bit of the security, because there were lack of role models, they feel insecure about themselves, mm -hmm. and then seeing more role, role models seems to really help latch on to girls and then say, oh, I can do it too. Right, even if it wasn't, too. yes, yeah. even if it wasn't half-half, even if people were there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, so speaking of sort of role models and heroes, are there people that come to mind for you guys of, you know, thing, people that really inspired you or helped you when it was challenging or some, some anybody come to mind that are sort of out there? You know, uh, it's funny because I remember reading an interview that you did, and and you were saying you always had a hard time thinking of role models or something. Was role that? model in a women form. In a women has form, been that's very right. Difficult. That's right. Because yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. But but to answer your question, um, I, when I when I was thinking about that, two people came to mind. Uh, Captain Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I find it very interesting. My the role the male role model is fictional um, because then the female would be Sally Ride. Uh -huh. So hmm. again, going back to my sort of space buff roots, yeah. I think those were two very inspirational models for me. Interesting. So I mean, for me, role models because I didn't know anything about tennis, mm -hmm. it's all tennis figures. So John McEnroe, yeah. and you know the the ability for him to play the kind of shots that nobody else did was one thing. Mm -hmm something about his 
personality, this rebellious nature. And I think there's something that wanted to break out of the mold for me. Mm -hmm. And Joe McEnroe did it. And I thought, wow, you know, very encouraging. This something that he's not ashamed to be different. Um, that, that really allowed me to sort of have him as an idol. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, amazing person. <laughs> yeah. um, so any, is, what's the best advice or some of, the best, some of the best advice either of you guys got that you can kind of think of? Or things that you did that you were like, that was the right thing to do. You know, when you kind of hit a fork or you're like, should I go this way or that way? What were some of the, the moments that you can think of? Those are hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, well, I'll, um, just a small, maybe a, more of an anecdote. I mean, I found that verbal advice, I, I, I mean, I'm a gatherer of information, mm -hmm. so I think I tend to get advice from a lot of people and then sort of synthesize and and make a decision. So it's hard to think of one thing, but um, when I was, you know, when I was, uh, um, when I was, I think I was probably 11 or 12 or 13, that kind of formative time, I had, I did a summer camp with a dance teacher. And it wasn't so much what this dance teacher said to me, he made me come out of myself mm -hmm. and not worry about what other people were saying or thinking or doing. Mm -hmm. And so it was one of the times, I think a very important time in my life where it was listen to your gut. It was be who you are. And you know, he made me dance in front of people and I am not a dancer. So that was actually, I think, a great formative moment that in the form of a f physical advice, mm -hmm. I would say. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think mine is really weird, but let me just try. Um, <laughs> ignorance, I sort of mentioned this a little bit, mm -hmm. but sometimes when you are thinking too much, just sort of stop thinking about it mm -hmm. and just let go mm -hmm. um, seems to actually help. So I think we all like to analyze it to death about some things like, I shouldn't do this, and this is not, not good, I'm not gonna be good at it, so I really shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that sort of thought process, sometimes it's good to just say, you know what, I'm just not gonna worry about it. It's really hard, to, it's easy to say, hard to do. And as well as, I think, some of us, and then I think you mentioned a little bit about not noticing, and I also feel like I didn't notice how few of us were around until pretty late, mm -hmm. and that really helped me uh -huh. to get through some of those moments. Um, and then I think that's, that's one of the things that if there's some ignorance that we can sort of put in ourselves, uh -huh. I think that would be great. You know what's interesting is uh, we do unconscious bias training on all Googlers, and uh, one of the things we learn is uh, there's a, a study that shows if there's 10 characteristics for a job, on average, uh, men will apply if they have at least three, and women will apply for a job if they have at least seven. Mm -hmm. And so I think in some ways maybe women are conditioned or they're automatically saying, I need more qualifications, I need more information, I, I need to, once I have all these skills, then I can apply for that. And, and some of the guys are maybe being socialized to just, hey, you have enough, you have a piece of it, go. Yeah. So it's sort of, to, I, to me, what you're saying tied into that. I totally agree. So in high school, I heard similar stats that um, boys who have B minus average in math and physics would apply to engineering. Girls would not apply unless they have A average. Yeah. And it's the same concept that I think, and then unfortunately that bias things, right? So as you go on, the women who actually lasted till then tend to be those A player. Yeah. But somehow for boys, it's okay to have a range. Right. Um, so if we can actually start to change that even earlier, in the pipeline, saying that you know you're getting B minus and in you know math, great, keep going, engineering, right. you know, right. apply for it. There is definitely a place for you. Right, because part of it is book smart, but a lot of it is practical, exactly. physical, just intuition and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can the journey, you know, apprentice journeyman master, you can learn these things. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So, um, what is something that you've seen recently, or some of the things you've seen that you're just like, oh my god, I love that, or I've been waiting for that to show up or something that in your research or work you're doing or something you've seen from another company or a research team or from you know, a science fair kid or anything out there that's been really cool that people should know about, you could think of. Well, I think that um, for me, the area of, of brain computer interaction and um, brain science and sensors and robotics and all of that coming together, the, the World Economic Forum just released their top 10 emerging technologies mm -hmm. for 2014. And um, quantified self was one of them, brain computer interfaces and body wearable sensors. Mm -hmm. And to me, that really um, encapsulated the ecosystem that I want to be part of going forward. 
um, the, the ability for us to really understand our brain function um, and then use that information to interact with our environment mm -hmm. and, and going back to our moonshot idea, eliminating, you know, eliminating disability, eliminating aging. I mean, we're all disabled in some way because we can't do everything we want to do. Mm -hmm. And so really enabling the human being through these technologies over the next you know, one, three, five years is going to be amazing. And I also like your point about teams, you know, the point yeah, of like, yeah. because it's also enabling teams. I mean, we see the basics of that in Wikipedia, the global team of yeah, sharing absolutely. what we know, we you know, with each human other. We human-machine interaction is one human and one machine, but really it's human to human to machine to human to machine interaction. Yeah, yeah. You and know? to each other and, and to each other. Uh, you know, yeah, all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 exactly. Globally. Exactly, yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I think... You know, one of the things that I'm really excited that we don't necessarily have yet, but we, we should, we're in the right trajectory to get, mm -hmm. is uh, mommy technology. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the technologies, because they're built by men, mm -hmm. they serve a lot of things that men like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we are moving in a very right direction where we're putting uh, technology-infused homes, right? For example, not to be a centric view of thinking about it, but that is now going to make mommy's tasks of tracking kids or some of the duties a little bit easier. And, you know, the more, more technology interface women get to have, the more chance the women get to understand the technology itself and says, oh, geez, I can contribute to this way of thinking technology and realize that they can do and they can become engineers and they can jump in. And I think that is sort of a good positive feedback. I completely agree. And also just in general parents and helping, not, you know, helping moms have an easier time so they can participate more and helping the guys, the dads, be able to participate uh, in different ways that they haven't been welcome or in. Uh, I think it's going to really change things a lot. So very insightful. So... That's a wrap. I want to uh, thank uh, Yoki and Corey for being here. The amazing uh, Robotics Brain Trust. This is Women Tech Makers. And uh, we'll see you in the next shows. <laughs>